everyone. Uh, this is Matt Britton. I am the CEO of Suzy. Thank you so much for joining our State of the Consumer webinar, our 12th edition called the eShopping Revolution. I should be joined any second um, by our special guest for today, um, Scott Latchett from PSFK. And there he is. Hey, Scott. I think you're on mute. There you go. Yeah. Great. great. Hey, how are you? I'm, I am, I am great. And thanks for having me excited to be here. Of course. We love all the work we've done, uh, with PSFK to date a little bit more on PSFK in a minute. Um, but you know, today we're really here to talk about, um, the e-commerce shopping rev revolution. Actually, Scott, even before we get started, why don't you just give a little bit of background about PSFK for those, um, who are unfamiliar with you guys? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so think of us as your sort of uh, research platform for qualitative insights as it applies to retail brand and consumer experience innovation. Um, we've got uh, our sort of membership platform where we've got a lot of great reports. We often partner with Suzy to bring their um, data-led insights into those reports. Um, we do custom publishing. We host events ourselves, um, and then we also have a bespoke consultancy um, where we help out brands like the Targets, the Samsungs, the BMWs of the world. Um, and if anyone is interested in knowing more, drop me a note at Scott at PSFK, um, but otherwise we'll uh, turn the attention back to the content today. Awesome. And Scott, just uh, you know, as a side note, being in the consumer insights, consumer trend space, over the last six months, it's been a wild ride. <laughs> um, what is there anything notable that you can think of that's been, I think, the biggest surprise uh, from you know from all these changes amongst the consumer audience? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I think you know this is not news, but um, you know what we're going to be touching on today is that sort of digital acceleration of sort of the world at this at this stage right now. Um, obviously a lot of that was already sort of, um, in the process of happening in, in various stages and levels of adoption. But, you know, the way that I think about it is when you have, um, my parents who are in their seventies, um, suddenly downloading the Walmart app to go, um, shopping online, um, you know, something dramatic has happened. Um, they share an email address and a mobile phone. So that's a big leap forward for them. <laughs> and yeah. Um, you know, the world in general is just like moving into that sort of um, next phase. And I, I think for me, it's really interesting to see how particularly as we sort of move out of, you know, in various ways um, that sort of uh, the um, shelter and home and, you know, businesses start to open back up, the interplay between digital and physical, particularly in retail is, is pretty fascinating. Absolutely. And we're going to be talking about that a lot today. Yeah. My mother, who's also in her seventies, I was with her this past weekend. She was talking to a friend about zoom and just taking a step back to think that that was just a niche business brand, not even that long ago. And now my mom's talking about it. Like it's a household brand. It just shows how far we've come in such a short period of time. Yeah. It's pretty incredible. So those of you who don't know uh, what Suzy is or who Suzy is, we are a real-time market research platform that works with some of the world's largest brands to help them make better, faster, uh, more data-driven decisions. We have an always-on market research tool that allows brands to top consumers 24 hours a day for instant feedback. And we use our Suzy tool for um, some of the research we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we conducted a study on August 27th with a sample size of 1,000 Americans, the samples direct representative of U.S. consumers working from home and census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So with that, we're going to jump in to now our 12th edition of the State of the Consumer webinar, the e-shopping revolution. Um, so according to IBM's U.S. retail index, uh, the pandemic accelerated our shift to e-commerce by five years. Um, it really did happen overnight. 76% um, increase in e-commerce sales from 2019, and online sales has now grown to $73 billion. Uh, the Forbes 400 just came out yesterday, the 400 richest people um, in the world, and Jeff Bezos um, actually is worth $50 billion more now than any human on the planet, um, and it's no coincidence that his wealth has increased the most on the, um, on the 400 list because he 
you know, obviously is focused in the e-commerce space. Um, I love this uh, graph from Bank of America that showed that during an eight week period from March to April, there was a bigger jump in e-commerce penetration as a percentage of overall retail sales than there was the 10 years before. So you could look back in the year 2009 and back in 2009, only 5.6% of all retail sales were online. And it took um, 10 years to go from basically five and a half percent to 16%. And then just a period of eight weeks went from 16% to 27%. To me, the biggest surprise on this graph is the fact that we're only at 27%, just over a quarter of, of all you know retail sales are online, which means that nearly three quarters of all retail sales are still offline. So it shows we might not be in the first inning anymore, but we're really just leaving the first quarter if it was in a football game because the NFL is starting tomorrow night. So I'll use that uh, I'll use that analogy. But, you know, we are still so early on and there's still so much upside uh, to be had for companies in the e-commerce space. Um, I thought this um, graph was really interesting uh, from Bizarre Voice, which actually shows the year over year growth by category. And one thing we've really seen pop up uh, during this pandemic is really consumers, um, A, trying to figure out how to do things at home where services would normally take the place of those things, but at the same time, leaning into online services to also help them bridge the gap in their lifestyles. And you can see that, that services are up 216% as a category in terms of um, year over year e-commerce growth. But then you have categories like sporting goods up nearly 200%, um, uh, vehicles and parts. You know, the, you talk about major categories that have been laggards and shifting the e-commerce and the automotive space has certainly been one. And we're seeing a huge rush um, you know, to the automotive space from consumers. Consumers in general are more interested in cars than they have been in quite some time because they're more feel for public transportation. They're not jumping on planes as much, you know, and, and there's definitely a, you know, a renaissance in the auto industry. Scott, I don't know if you've seen any anything either out of the auto industry or anything else pop out from this slide in terms of category. Yeah, I mean, we, we're in the process of doing a bunch of research right now within the sort of auto buying experience. And, you know, particularly in the U.S., it's always been a challenge from a sort of digital to physical standpoint with the dealership always having to play a role in that process unless you're a Tesla. Um, but amazing to see how quickly they've sort of adopted a new set of tools. Um, you know, often the sort of dealer management tool is kind of bandied about, but yeah, a lot of those friction points that you typically had to go into a dealer for what, you know, specifically around the financing um, delivery of the vehicle, um, insurance, and all of those sort of steps that kind of made the, the process um, much less exciting are now happening online in sort of record numbers. And, you know, you have a lot of people who are, you know, buying vehicles sight unseen, having them delivered to their homes, and then, you know, literally driving away um, right at that stage. So it's, it's pretty amazing to see how that is shifting what the physical dealer will look like, um, you know, sort of from here on out and what role they'll play in the, the retail experience. Yep, not only are people buying cars uh, sight unseen and being delivered to their homes, they're actually buying homes themselves sight unseen, uh, which shows how crazy things have gotten. Um, some other categories that pop out to me here, toys and games, you know, I think, and we talked about this during our last State of the Consumer about the home and how Parents are really looking increasingly for ways to get their kids off of screens and to engage with them. And, you know, there are several um, stories about people who started their own puzzle company or board gate company and they can't keep them in stock because there's such demand for toys and games in the home to pe uh, keep people entertained. And we'll go through many of these other categories as we go through today's presentation. Um, so even brands that you wouldn't think would gravitate towards e-commerce are starting to do so now because they see this wave happening in so many categories, whether it's automobile, especially in the food and beverage space. Um, you have brands like Kit Kat that are now, and, and a lot of companies that are in the CPG and food and beverage space really just gravitate towards e-commerce, thinking that consumers could will purchase from them directly. Now, some of these low involvement categories might end up being a little more challenging because is a consumer really going to go to 
you know, 30 different sites to buy different things in each category when they are so predisposed to going somewhere like Amazon. So if these CPGs are going to get into the space and you have companies like Johnson & Johnson and Procter & Gamble that are really getting serious about their direct-to-consumer e-commerce efforts, you know, they're going to have to look into some type of bundling um, to make it more convenient for the consumer. And then there's the whole issue of prime and free shipping, which we're going to get into. But we're certainly seeing brands in nearly every category start to look um, very seriously at the direct to consumer channels because some of these shifts they don't think are temporary they think they're they're going to be quite long lasting um we are starting to see in certain categories and areas just this dramatic growth in e-commerce slow down just a bit um for example online grocery sales in june only increased nine percent versus 37 percent in april part of that is that the leap was so very large um in the month of march and april and even may that there wasn't much more growth to capture but make no mistake the shift to online grocery shopping is really here to stay and you know we're seeing it play out with so many companies that are really booming right now um by you know offering consu consumers the ability to grocery shop from home without ever leaving uh, their couch. Um, certain categories in the food and beverage space have exploded and really came out of nowhere. Um, alcohol being one of the most notables. What's interesting about the uh, beer and liquor and spirits category is you know, the, it's really a tale of, of two industries. You have the on-premise business, bars, nightclubs, restaurants, which has been decimated. And that business in some, you know, some months has gone down near to zero. But at the same time, the off-premise business, people consuming uh, beer and liquor in their homes um, has actually just skyrocketed. And not only is it skyrocketed, but skyrocketed particularly within the e-commerce space. A company called Drizzly, uh, for example, just recently uh, raised $50 million based on recent growth for alcohol, e-commerce and delivery. That is a place where Amazon has not really played to date. So it creates a major opportunity. And we're gonna see that really as a theme throughout today is a lot of the opportunities that still exist in e-commerce are opportunities that Amazon is really yet to dominate. But obviously, uh, those categories are becoming few and far between as that company continues to scale. Um, so today, we're going to really look at consumer habits and product preferences to better understand the future of e-commerce. And uh, you know, the, the presentation is going to be in two different categories. First, habits, what are people doing? And second, products. What are people buying? And before we go into our first section on habits, um, for those of you who've been on our um, most recent State of Consumer webinar, as you know, we have a section called Ask America, where we'll let you, the audience, tell us what question you want us to ask our audience, um, our panel, and we will have those answers at the end of today's webinar. So the first questions for you to vote on um, are as follows. Um, which question do you want to see consumers answer most? One, what are the biggest challenges you've had with VR, AR brand experiences? That's virtual reality and augmented reality. Two, which brand do you miss visiting in store the most? Three, do you think you'll ever shop exclusively online? And four, for parents, do your kids, 18 and under, prefer to shop online or in store? So for that last question, we would just ask um, parents of kids that are 18 and under. So you can pick the question you most would like to see answered by our panel, and we will go into our first section. So e-commerce e and, and e-shopping, one of the biggest benefits for consumers is really about endless choice. I mean, I can speak for myself in wanting to patronize stores that I live in Brooklyn and wanting to make sure because anyone who's in a city right now sees just, um, you know, the, the out of business or closing soon signs just rampant outside retail stores, just littering the city. And, you know, I, like many people, want to you know, help these local businesses stay in business. And the problem I often find is the things I want to buy actually aren't there. And obviously um, with e-commerce companies, that's a huge advantage they have against brick and mortar stores is they don't really have, you know, that, you know, that, the, the, the straps on them to limit the, in the inventory in their stores so they could really offer limitless choice to consumers. 91% uh, of online shoppers feel they can find everything or most things online. So that issue of not being able to find the product that you want most doesn't really exist um, with shoppers when they're online. And that's something that I think, again, brick and mortar stores really have to grapple with. Um, so we ask consumers and, and our, our, our panel, do you wish any brand was more easily accessible online? And the answer that came back first and foremost was no specific brand. So consumers really believe that they can access any product, 
any brand online. So availability just and the issue of availability kind of just gets knocked out as a concern uh, for consumers. So much so that now many consumers are gravitating towards sites just to buy things that they didn't even know that they wanted. Um, I thought this was really interesting. Um, on eBay, people can actually purchase um, Cheetos that are shaped like a um, lobster claw. So why would anybody want to buy that? Who knows? But you can actually see that there's there's bidding for the craziest things online. And many consumers who have time at home are looking for these novelty or real specialty items. Um, there was a baseball card that was sold um, from a from a, one of the best players in, in the game right now, um, Steve Trout, that Mike Trout, that actually went for over three million dollars. So obviously not all of us can buy that sort of stuff. I would probably just stick to the, uh, the lobster claw Cheeto. But um, the fact that many consumers are home right now, they're looking for things to buy, they're looking for new hobbies. You're finding this long tail of products that are being uh, pursued by consumers. Uh, one huge beneficiary of the shift has been Etsy. Etsy has been a company whose stock has exploded since the pandemic. Uh, they were one of the first online retailers to get into the mass space. The, the notion of selling masks it has been something that obviously would have been foreign a year ago. Now it's a booming multi-billion dollar industry and Etsy opened it up to its uh, network of product creators and all of a sudden sort of had an endless inventory of masks and every type of design and shape you can imagine. And that along with just their very creative inventory has really skyrocketed that company. So I think the long tail in retail, the long tail in e-commerce really has so much legs to it right now. Consumers want more choice than ever before. If you look at the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, the retailers who really um, did well were companies like The Gap, where you'd go into The Gap and you could buy the blue t-shirt, the gray t-shirt, the red t-shirt, right? It was just more about value and quality, but it wasn't about choice. But now as consumers want to build their own personal brands and they want to actually buy products that really best express themselves, they have the ability to do so. And that becomes a huge opportunity in e-commerce as Etsy has proved um, as of late. So, um, you know, consumers have seen that the traditional channels are limiting. Um, only 14% uh, of shoppers actually believe they'll shop online less post-crisis. So many of these shifts many of the times where consumers have bought products in a new category for the first time, they've come to the conclusion that they're never going back. And that really is going to be problematic for so many retailers that are hoping that once the pandemic ends, they're going to be able to open up their retail stores uh, and go back to business as usual. In many categories, there just won't be any more business as usual. You know, will hardware stores be able to return? Will, um, will um, physical apparel stores be able to return to the way they were prior? You look at the death of specialty retailer, um, you know, across the board, we're seeing one bankruptcy after the other um, occur. That may not just be a trend that's related to COVID. That may be a trend that was happening for a very long time that's now just being accelerated and may be the new way of, of um, you know, retailers having to go to market where there's just not going to be that brick and mortar opportunity. Um, Michael's has been another great story. I don't know, uh, Scott, I know that you, Mike, you're a fan of Michael's and what they've been doing recently, especially in the e-commerce space. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think this, this touches on, um, you know, one of the points that you made earlier in the presentation is, I mean, A, they were uniquely positioned to sort of um, pick up on the, all this time at home, um, where suddenly people were um, looking for looking for things to do, had a lot of time on their hands, um, and had the you know basically you know to your point, endless selection of all of the various sort of creative projects and arts and crafts things that you could want to do at home. Um, the thing that I think is that they're uniquely positioned um, to sort of capitalize on, along with any store that sort of traditionally has operated brick and mortar is that sort of, you know, interconnection between the two with the sort of buy online, pick up and store option, yeah. which, I, you know, again, will be something that we, we touch on here, but thinking, you know, not exclusively as, you know, digital or physical sort of existing in a vacuum, but how the two sort of, um, you know, sort of work um, alongside one another in order to, um, you know, create a, a bigger, better experience ultimately. And so I think, Absolutely. you know, as, as we see sort of physical continue to sort of play a role, that sort of like curbside um, pickup is just going to continue to be uh, a sort of new functionality um, or just the sort of fulfillment from store 
that's going to be critical as we as we sort of um, you know continue forward. Yeah, I mean we we've seen this pop up in our research. Actually, there's a term for it called BOPIS, which is buy online, pick up in store. That I will learn through one of our prior webinars. But the reason that uh, some consumers gravitate towards you know the omni-channel approach again, the store like Michael's that obviously has the physical store footprint, but also as evidenced by their 300 plus percent increase in e-commerce, a huge e-commerce present is consumers just have more confidence in the supply chain and their ability to get the product delivered. And also in the event there's problems that they want to return, instead of just putting it in a box and shipping it back out, they know they can bring it to the store and get that return or get that exchange. So that's definitely a benefit. And, and that's why uh, you know Amazon went and they bought Whole Foods. And that's why I think Amazon will continue to purchase physical retailers for that footprint, um, especially in uh, affluent cities where consumers, again, want that omnichannel that based approach. Um, in terms of online shopping, we're seeing browsing really happen in two places. First of all, on the retail website, and that's really what you'd expect. But second of all, on social media. Social media has become, uh, which at first was just a tool for engagement and really top of the funnel activity. Increasingly, especially as companies like Facebook and Google have more pressure from Wall Street to continue their growth, have become more down funnel tactics for brands to actually drive sales. Um, Instagram, as of late, has really been pushing its e-commerce functionality, which allows consumers to see it, an influencer or another consumer post a product and actually just purchase it uh, right from their feed. And I think you're going to continue to see a bigger shift occur. And this really started with content, right? It, brands for such a long time invested so much money in their own dot com. And then what they started to realize is that's not where the eyeballs were, right? And what they started to do is shift their content creation strategy to social media so they could reach consumers where they are. I actually see a same path happening right now with e-commerce where Right now, many can, many brands are still trying to drive consumers to their .com to drive commerce when the reality is consumers are spending their time on their phone, not only just on the phone, in the feed. And when they're in the feed, they're looking at interesting things and people that they care about. And that really now has become the new e-commerce opportunity, which means that companies like Facebook and Google and even Twitter have huge upside and TikTok, if it ever gets out of the mess they're in, in terms of being able to drive commerce and really makes brands either rethink their online e-commerce distribution strategy to be able to drive demand based upon where consumers are. Um, you know, women definitely are predisposed to, to exploring new products on retailer sites, especially in certain categories like apparel that, that really popped up in our, um, in a lot of our research. Um, you know, some of the more low involvement, um, you know, categories where maybe consumers are making more quick decisions. Uh, that's where e-commerce can play in, whether it's accessories, um, or, or, or products that, you know, over a lower price point social media really becomes much more of a powerful tactic with those categories, but we're really starting to see it happen across the board. Um, we know that Amazon really is a thorn in the side of so many retailers and has just taken out one category by the next. One place that Amazon has not really penetrated yet has been um, apparel and especially on the luxury end. And now we're starting to see Amazon preparing to launch a luxury fashion platform. Uh, they bought a company called Shop Up several years ago uh, as kind of their first major foray into the fashion e-commerce space. I mean, Scott, do you think Amazon is going to be able to enter and dominate this category as they have so many other categories? I mean, it's it's challenge from a, you know, purely from a consumer point of view, I find the functionality of shopping on Amazon to be a pretty terrible um terrible experience, but despite that, obviously given the the sort of choice, price, and sort of convenience of sort of doing so, it's almost, you know, in some ways the default search engine for the way that people will approach shopping in a lot of ways. And I mean, this is in some ways, it goes back to what you were talking about with social media is how distributed the sort of like e-commerce sort of browsing and shopping experience is, is that um, you know, you really need to go where people's eyeballs are and people's eyeballs are within the context of Amazon. I think yeah. in terms of, you know, from what I understand about this sort of foray that they are giving a lot more control to the brands in terms of how they can sort of like set up the look and feel of the page, maintain a little bit more of that sort of control over that experience. And so I think if it's tightly curated um, 
and easily sort of, um, you know, searchable or locatable within the context of, you know, the bigger Amazon experience, then I think there's a big, um, you know, sort of role for them to play. And I guess they're, you know, they're competing against the Netaporters and the Farfetches and the sort of, uh, you know, those more specialized sites of the world. Right. So it'll Revolve. be right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th I agree. I mean, so, and when you say Amazon is not a, a great shopping experience, I think, do you, because at the same time, you also said it's easy and there's a lot of choice. I think what you mean is just like, it's not a beautiful, engaging user experience. It's more well, utilitarian. You know, and there's a lot of, I mean, for me personally, I think like, you know, they have gamed the system in terms of like, you know, even when you try to search for specific products, um, what is actually returned in terms of the search results is, um, you know, often, um, you know, whatever the Amazon algorithm chooses to sort of um, prioritize, whether through, right. you know, you know, I don't want to say people are, I, I don't know, quote unquote, if people are paying for those um, sort of search results, but. Well, they, uh, they certainly are. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's a lot going on. I mean, Amazon's media business is one of the fastest growing media businesses in the world. Um, Amazon has also had um, some antitrust muff, um, rumblings lately just about, you know, Amazon pushing consumers towards their own private label sure. products. They have hundreds of private label brands where they are basically seeing a surfboard that's selling on Amazon at, by a third party, you know, manufacturer, and then they will create that same exact surfboard uh, with a slightly different design with a brand that Amazon owns so you can keep the margins. And that has become a big issue for the same long tail that's driving on Etsy. And that's why we are seeing explosions in companies like Shopify. You know, you look at the stock of Shopify this year and it's astronomical. They're worth nearly $200 billion because what Shopify is doing is it's allowing merchants and manufacturers of small businesses to get off Amazon and to create their own dot com where basically they can get up and running with their own e-commerce store overnight. Um, again, the problem with that is distribution and traffic. If you sell on Amazon, you have almost limitless distribution. If you open your own store, yes, you can capture the customer data. Yes, you can capture a bigger share of every dollar you sell, but how are you gonna get consumers there? And then that becomes a whole other issue, which is why you're seeing brands now lean more into um, you know, Facebook. That's why when there was that big boycott of big brands on Facebook, it didn't really hurt Facebook because they have such a long tail of small and medium business size advertisers and a lot of those small, medium business size advertisers are advertising to could drive people to their own Shopify site. So there's a whole nother ecosystem that's kind of building up. Right. I agree with you on the, on the luxury side. I think that, I, I think it's gonna be very hard. If I were Amazon, I actually, if I was creating a luxury shopping platform, I wouldn't call it Amazon. Yeah, I would. I would. Yeah, I would. I would call it something else because I think the luxury shopper still cares about where they buy things, um, and that's why you don't really see luxury stores in non-affluent areas. You see it on in Soho or the Champs Elysees. You know, you see it in these places that matters. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how this. I think it's much more likely they create private label brands that are slightly cheaper for more like um, luxury wannabe shoppers versus the actual luxury fashion shoppers, but we'll right. have to see. You can't yeah, get off Jeff Bezos. Yeah, and you never and you never know, to your point, like, you know, so much of this is a data play for them too, where it's just like, you know, they can build this, see what people are clicking around on, and then yeah, suck that into whatever sort of um, you know, sort of product development um aspect that they want to in in many ways too. So yeah. I think, you know, they approach it from e-commerce from a very business centric point of view. And I think obviously the, in order to differentiate you, you know, one way is to think about it very much from the consumer point of view, um, if you're trying to compete with Amazon. So, yeah. Uh, the big question I think Scott is going to be like, as we go from 24% penetration to 50% penetration of e-commerce, how much of those next 26 points of market share are going to be Amazon's, right? How much is going to be on Shopify? How much is going to be, from new entrants or existing entrants, we're gonna talk about Walmart in a second, is Walmart gonna finally wake up and start to execute in this space relative to their power in bricks and mortar retail or companies like Target, they're great merchandisers who have really been run over by Amazon. The question is, what does catching up mean? Um, and you know, I happen to think that the one-click shopping, Prime, uh, you know, the limitless choices, that's really what's driven um, Amazon's success. I mean, I think, you know, you can't underestimate the power of Amazon Prime, 
right? And now what they've started to do with building out an ecosystem where, um, you know, they have um, the, the voice devices, the Echo, um, you know, Alexa devices that are in the home, they're, they're tr trying to become ubiquitous. And now they're getting into content and they're gonna start to be able to drive commerce from their Amazon Prime, um, you know, streaming. So they really are surrounding um, you know, the consumer. And I think other retailers are really going to have to innovate, partner, acquire to really be able to catch up. Um, talking about innovating, I mean, I've always loved this company and I love the founders. Um, I know well of Warby Parker, which is a company that has really come into a sleepy industry, um, the eyewear industry, and pushed out the 800 pound gorilla Luxottica, or not pushed them out, but it put pressure on them um, by really thinking consumer first focusing on well-priced, high-quality products, and now really innovating from an e-commerce standpoint. And this has really proved incredibly valuable to them amidst this pandemic. If you wear glasses and you haven't tried out Warby Parker's um, online tryout tool, I would uh, really beg you to do so. We hear a lot about augmented reality um, and really the future of it. And many of that has really been you know, over promised and under delivered. But in this case, it actually has been over delivered on where you can actually um, have a picture of your face and actually try on any pair of glasses and see exactly how they would look and fit on you. And I think this is the type of innovation that new brands need to do if they're really going to be able to break through. Because Scott, I agree that your point is, you know, it's such a um, mundane experience on Amazon, despite the convenience and speed they give you. But what Amazon isn't doing is things like this. And it's these type of immersive experiences that drive brand love and and create um, you know loyalty and advocacy amongst consumers. And I think more brands need to invest in innovative ways to really engage with the consumers online. I don't know. I see you're wearing glasses, Scott. Are you a Warby Parker a shopper? I, and have you ever tried this? I have in the past, but I've but I've shifted to, I've shifted my allegiances back to uh, Saul Mascot. So I'll oh, wow, okay. And then um, yeah, they're old school, but. Uh, but I have, but to your point, you know, I think Warby Parker from the get go was really sort of thinking about how they could, um, you know, create new experiences for customers. They've, they now have the app that allows you to do your vision tests through your mobile device. Um, you know, very early on in the process, they were doing the sort of try on home, um, yeah. experience, which was great. Um, you know, I did it once when we still had offices and, you know, everyone sort of like came in and was trying on the various classes. So it can be, you know, it's like things like that, um, you know, go a long way in terms of like, you know, creating that sort of love for a brand. So um, it's funny. Yeah. when you when you said, Scott, back in the day when we used to have offices, it's almost like last year, if I would have said somebody back in the day when we used to use uh, VCRs or fax machines. I mean, <laughs> it, it does feel like so long exactly. ago, which is, exactly. which is scary and sad at the same time. Um, this is interesting. Nearly half of consumers feel like texts from brands are helpful and they like them. Men find texts even less intrusive than women. I would hate getting texts from brands. Um, although now that I think about it, the, you know, I bank with uh, Bank of America and Chase and I get texts from both of them. And I don't necessarily mind getting texts from them. So I guess if, if providing utility and value, you know, your credit card is due or here's, a, here's an instant pop-up discount. Um, I guess I can see how it breaks through. I mean, the one thing that's undeniable is that email marketing has become uh, less effective over time uh, as so many uh, you know companies have dove into it and the breakthrough you know uh, direct messaging and text messaging has been uh, one of the last salvations for brands to try to you reach out and touch your consumers for sure. So one popular opinion is that mobile is king for e-shopping, but that's not really always the case. 63% uh, of shoppers like to use their desktop to browse and even more, 68% of shoppers like to use their desktop to buy. Um, I am personally somebody who's always been comfortable with buying even like expensive plane tickets um, on my mobile device. But for many consumers, there's still this psychological block where if they're gonna spend a certain amount of money, they feel it's either less secure or less substantive to do it on their phone and would much rather do it on the desktop. And also to your point, Scott, it's harder to create those immersive experiences on the smaller screen. So I think for both of those reasons, you know, you still see the importance of a desktop and there's been just a huge uh, groundswell of interest in buying laptops and desktop computers in the home as we've traveled less. 
you know, there was a time where we thought that we were going to have the end of the laptop, right? But now everybody needs a laptop for um, being on Zoom all day. So I think it's kind of created a resurgence for brands that have to relook at their um, desktop based channels versus just focusing on mobile commerce, which we thought at one point prior to the pandemic was the be all end all. And, you know, there's analogies with that with like podcasting where, you know, podcasting has seen pressure in certain categories because people would listen to podcasts when they were commuting to work. Um, and now they're not, they're just commuting down the steps. And as a result, um, you know, there's pressure on that. So these are all type of changes that have come out um, of all this. So we talked a little bit of Amazon and like what it takes to be a winning e-shopping brand. And, um, you know, there's definitely learnings coming out. We talked about the ease and ubiquity of Amazon, uh, the utilitarian, you know, no nonsense based approach, which really gets you what you want, exactly what you want, the quickest, cheapest way possible. It's kind of what Amazon's delivered, but that's obviously come at, at the expense of creating these immersive experiences, which matter, especially if you talk about apparel or luxury or automotive. Um, Walmart, you know, and this is a very, um, I think, critical announcement, really in the life cycle of e-commerce. If you think about e-commerce starting around the year 1997, so about 20 years ago, a little more than 20 years ago, um, you had Amazon come up very early in that life cycle. Uh, eBay was really the first big e-commerce winner. Um, and there's been so many other winners in many categories along the way. But Amazon has been the story over the first um, 20 years. And we mentioned some of the you know other big retailers like Walmart, who have been a dominant offline player, especially in middle America and, 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 and other areas of the country, not uh, you know on the coasts. And now, finally, they're coming out with something called Walmart Plus, which is taking on Amazon Prime with a $98 membership fee. And I always thought Prime was the biggest moat for Amazon. Um, the fact that you don't have to pay for shipping meant that you just is one less thing to think about. And so many people had Prime that it really just created such a competitive advantage. With Amazon entering this space, I think it will put pressure on them because at, what, at, what I mean, sorry, Walmart entering the space because Walmart has so much buying power and they have great merchandising. They have such a powerful in-store footprint. And if we believe, Scott, you and I both believe this, that having an omni-channel based approach, having the physical stores, having the online presence is ultimately what consumers are looking for. Well, then Walmart really can lean into that as a competitive advantage, layer on this Walmart Plus, and maybe they'll finally be able to put some pressure on Amazon. I mean, what do you think? Do you think Walmart Plus has a chance? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that much about the sort of nuts and bolts of what is included in that membership. Right. Fee, but again, you know, it's like you, it's that perception of value. You're locking people in um, around that membership fee. Um, and to your point, there's sort of like, one less uh, step to take in terms of thinking about making a purchase. You know, I mean, even in the, you know, not too distant past before Amazon Prime existed, it was always like you'd hold things in your cart until you had enough to sort of get free shipping. And now it's just like something comes in and you're like, okay, I'm going to get that boom. And then to your point, um, you know, I think the BOPIS opportunity for Walmart or any retailer is to think about what are all the things that I can, you know, it, people have a limited amount of time. And when you have the store as a sort of, um, you know, a, a sort of gathering point or, or draw, draw for consumers, what can you get out of the way for them ahead of time? So that then with that 10, 15 minutes, whatever it is, that they can actually go into the store and then, you know, discover that, um, you know, that thing that they weren't thinking about or, you know, try something on. There's a, there's just so much like added value that you can create within the context of that experience. You know, you're you order a bunch of things. It's there when you arrive at your Walmart. You try them on. You decide there's a couple things that you don't want, and then the rest you take home, and that's saving you the trip. It's like all sort of like condensed into that one visit. And so I think for me, convenience is not always about speed, it's about quality as well. So quality of time. Um, and I think that's a big opportunity that Walmart has or anyone that's sort of like leveraging that sort of on to offline kind of uh, um, sort of equation. Yep, absolutely. I was really interested, and this happened back in November, that Nike made the announcement to pull its products from Amazon. Um, you know, that is a volume versus quality, um, you know, 
dilemma that they were faced with where, yes, they were selling volume of their product on Nike. Um, it's funny because Apple actually went the other way. Apple for a while was hesitant to sell any of their products on Amazon because they want to create the brand experience. Um, they really start to get uh, you know pressure from Wall Street to drive more growth and more volume. And the place to get it was sort of the wave the white flag and go on to Amazon where Nike kind of did the opposite. Nike is a lifestyle premium brand that has um, long relied on their ability to, to tap into the culture of sports um, and and athletes and really do and really pop culture in general. And they saw their brand being eroded and commoditized by being on the Amazon platform. And they decided we're pulling off from Amazon. We're going to sell direct to consumers. And now they're really doubling down. They're, they're continuing to cut out retail partners. Um, Scott, what are your thoughts on what Nike is doing in this arena? Well, I think they're, I mean, I, I, I mean, it's obviously, a, a, you know, to your point, it's, it's potential risk, but I think like they have a really great um, sort of, you know, shopping product or retail product sort of already out in the marketplace. Um, you know, one of the big pivots they made is they had sort of a dis, sort of like a distributed app experience. They've all sort of tried to collapse that into one um, mobile experience, which adds a lot of value as both a sort of owner of Nike products or a fan of Nike products, as well as in the context of that shopping experience. For them, it's mobile has become sort of the gateway into the Nike universe in many ways. So it's both the sort of um, funnel into the brand They'll serve you up content and shopping recommendations based on the things that you've sort of um, volunteered and over time your interactions through the app. Um, they now have store modes um, that interact with their physical retail locations that enable you to do a lot of interesting things within the context of the store. Um, and then it's also a mobile or a, a loyalty play as well. Um, so your interactions within the context of the app personalize the experience even more, and then they reward you with a lot of partnerships um, within the context of that. They get a lot of amazing data as a result of that, and then that allows them to be smarter as a business. Um, you know, and so a lot of those um, digital interactions are being used to even sort of um, determine what local inventory is available at certain stores and things like that, which I think is yeah. you know, pretty incredible. So it'll be interesting to see you know, they've, they've taken their app technology and even used it um, in the context of one preferred partner right now, which is Foot Locker. So they're even sort of like, um, you know, almost putting up a walled garden within the context of that multi-brand retailer as well, which I think is really interesting too. Yeah. But if, 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 if anyone has not read the book Shoe Dog yet, which is uh, about the founding of Nike and Phil Knight's journey, um, I would highly recommend it. It's one of the greatest business books I've ever read. Couldn't put it down, so highly recommend it. Uh, the other thing I'll say about Nike is they really long take advantage of the long tail theory that we're seeing put on Etsy right now. I mean, there are literally uh, hundreds of thousands of different types of Nike shoes. Um, and now there's secondary marketplaces like StockX, talk about growth in e-commerce, peer-to-peer marketplaces where you have 15, 16, 17 year old kids, you know, making $100,000 a year by selling and reselling uh, sneakers. And Nike has put themselves really at the center of sneaker culture, uh, which is really the crossroads um, of art and design and sport and music really all coming together. And for the Gen Z audience, it really has been uh, a huge mover um, of products and culture. So we're gonna move into our next section now, um, products, what people are buying. But first we're gonna quickly go into our Ask America section once again, to see what question you want us to ask our Susie panel. Uh, which of these four questions would you like answered by the end of the webinar? One, what are your favorite types of products to buy online? Two, what are your least favorite types of products to buy online? Three, which products do you purchase most frequently online? And four, what types of products do you wish there was a subscription service for? Nike also recently got into subscription service for kids. For those of you who have kids, uh, you know, their feet grow incredibly fast. Uh, they launched in beta a subscription service where you basically pay a fixed amount of money every year. And as your kids' little feet continue to grow, you can just send the old ones in and get new ones back. And I think you know, subscription is obviously another huge, uh, you know, opportunity for brands in the e-commerce space. 
So online right now, shoppers feel the most comfortable buying. And we talk about the low involvement categories, but you know, personal care products and personal care products have, you know, always been the popular list groceries. Now it's just crazy how quickly groceries have come become something that is commonplace. For so long, we really thought that consumers would be hesitant to buy groceries because they wanted to touch and feel their produce, you know, make sure they were buying fresh stuff. They didn't trust the quality, um, especially of fresh foods getting delivered. But now um, this pandemic has forced consumers to purchase groceries online. They did so because they didn't want to risk their health by going to the supermarket in areas where they could. They've quickly learned that it is a great way to purchase groceries. Uh, groceries. And obviously that plays right into the hands of Amazon, who, as I mentioned, uh, recently purchased Whole Foods. Um, E-shopping tactics for replenishment are key. You know, for consumable products that you're buying on an ongoing regular basis, it, it creates a massive opportunity for recurring revenue where these companies know that you're buying milk or eggs or orange juice every three weeks. And over time, they'll get to know your shopping habits, make it easier for you. So whenever there's something that you're replenishing, that becomes a huge e-commerce um, opportunity. Um, one thing that consumers replenish with uh, right now, every single day, for many, including myself, it's uh, multiple times a day, is coffee. And now we're starting to see coffee subscription services pop up. Um, I believe Starbucks will probably announce a subscription service soon. They've seen so much success from their mobile ordering. They have so much first party data. Um, they're, they're such a habitual consumer. Why wouldn't Starbucks get into subscription games? So I think um, that's something you could probably expect to see. And many other local coffee shops are starting to get into the subscription space as it relates to coffee. What do you think about that, Scott? Would you subscribe to coffee? Yeah, I mean, I think the opportunity here, and I know it's, it, you know, you touched on it a little bit at the beginning when you, when you sort of flip through the, the Kit Kat example, um, you have, you know, in the case of coffee, it's a little bit higher, um, higher price point. And so you can sort of justify, um, you know, the shipping associated with it, etc. But I think the thing that subscription, in addition to that sort of recurring revenue is, um, there's an opportunity to do a lot of interesting things around the sort of like bundling and the unboxing of that experience. I think a couple questions have popped up about what's the emotional sort of play within the, um, you know, the sort of e-commerce space. Um, you know, we've all opened up an Amazon box and it's just a brown box and there it is, there's your product and a bunch of packaging, packaging that you have to throw away. But there's so many opportunities that are sort of present in that sort of unboxing experience. I think there's a whole untapped kind of opportunity there. Um, and a lot of brands are thinking about sampling within the context of that experience, um, adding content, you know, the Nike example you just touched on, they had a lot of fun sort of activities. They personalize that experience a little bit for the kids as a part of that. So, um, you know, beyond the sort of utility of like a recurring product coming, you know, there's so much more added value that, you know, doesn't cost a lot for brands to sort of um, add into that experience as well. Absolutely. Um, in terms of where shoppers feel the least comfortable buying, we see outdoor equipment, probably because just the bulk and, you know, they could tend to be more expensive and then apparel. And again, apparel is just all about fit. You, you look at what Warby Parker did with the glasses space and they made sure that you, the, the consumer, you know, got the assurance that they would get a product that would fit them. And for many consumers in buying apparel, they still don't feel that they're going to, you know, know that whatever they buy is going to look right. And even though, yes, they can return it, it's still a hassle. They're still waiting to get what they want to wear. And, you know, I think that's created, you know, opportunities in your apparel space, which we'll get into. Um, one, you know, you see this, this company, the Black Tux, and it's free home try on. Uh, another company, I thought I threw a slide in here about it, but maybe I didn't, is uh, Rent the Runway. So, is this Rent the Runway right here? I think it is. Yeah. It just got out of order for some reason. But Rent the Runway is a company that I think uh, really was on it well on its way to reinventing the apparel space, uh, especially amongst, um, you know, young female professionals, where basically, for those of you who don't know what Rent the Runway is, it's a apparel subscription uh, platform where you pay anywhere between $100 to $220 a month, and you could get three to four garments at a time, accessories, bags, handbags. After you use them or wore them, you return them, almost like the old Netflix DVDs, and you would get new garments. 
Um, if you dropped off the garments at a receptacle that they had in some of their biggest markets, um, you would actually get the new garments the same day. Um, where I live in Brooklyn, the receptacle inside of WeWork, it mornings had lines outside the door of people returning. And I think this takes away a lot of the angst that you know consumers have with buying apparel online because worst case scenario, you get something and basically it doesn't fit. You just, you're not buying it, you're sending it back. Um, especially in a world of Instagram where many women think that once they've worn something once or twice and they put it on Instagram, they can never wear it again because everyone's seen them wear it. It allowed them to really play with their own personal styles and really play that long tail in the apparel space. And even though Rent the Retail also had a, uh, a Rent the Runway had a retail presence that obviously they just shut down because as a result of this, I think this company has a lot of legs moving forward um, in the in the apparel space. And it's one way that I think a company can innovate, use subscription based recurring revenue in a new business model to really again Amazon proof the their pro their product in an industry that Amazon really hasn't entered yet. So it'll certainly be interesting to see where it goes. Um, electronics has seen a massive boom during the pandemic. Um, you know, electronic hardware and consumer electronics really was on its way to being commoditized before the pandemic. Uh, as we mentioned, most consumers really weren't focusing on buying laptops. Um, consumers that had iPhones were just waiting for the new iPhone to come out and then they would get a new one, but there wasn't much, a lot of choice. Consumers that were on the Android platform were buying Samsungs. They would stick with the Galaxy. There wasn't really many new entrants in the consumer electronics hardware space compared to, let's say, 10, 15 years ago when flat screens first became a thing. But now with work from home, we're seeing shortages of laptops. We're seeing companies like Logitech sell out of their webcams. We're seeing um, luxury um, home electronics brands like Dyson um, really explode in selling things like um, hair dryers and vacuum cleaners that are stylish for their home. So it's really created a big resurgence in the consumer electronics space. Companies like Sonos, more new age consumer electronics companies have continued to grow um, and hardware has really made a resurgence as a result of people investing more in the home. And one way that consumers try to really upgrade their home is in the consumer electronics space. Uh, so that, that's been definitely interesting that's happened. And we've seen obviously a lot of issues with the supply chains, um, not to mention uh, the whole China trade issue that's being driven uh, on a geopolitical basis. And it'll be interesting to see what happens in the consumer electronics um, space uh, moving forward. Um, we talked about apparel and also obviously the opportunity with companies like uh, Rent the Runway. 49% uh, of shoppers are buying even more personal care online. Now, personal care obviously creates a massive opportunity because it is um, largely um, you know, a lower price point product, although even luxury personal care products are now moving off the shelves um, in the um, e-commerce space. Um, it is one of those repeat purchases where you're replenishing, so it creates a big opportunity in that space. It's also a, a, a category, especially as you veer towards maybe the beauty side of, of personal care, where influencers and social media have a huge uh, input on the buying buyer's journey. So it creates a, you know, a huge opportunity. We have seen a massive increase in purchasing of luxury personal care items uh, during the pandemic. Many point to, and I didn't learn about this until preparing for this webinar, uh, something called the lipstick effect, uh, where consumers will buy higher priced, more prestigious lipsticks. Uh, it says specifically Chanel that are used uh, in public versus lower price, less prestigious brands um, during times of economic distress. Um, and we saw that happen, for example, after 9-11 and, and, and people think that maybe it's the, the, the lipstick effect combined with the Zoom effect. But we're seeing a resurgence in interest in luxury personal care and luxury beauty items as a result of the pandemic. So it's just interesting that you guys would, uh, enjoy hearing about that. Um, so direct to consumer personal care brands are now seizing on consumers changing habits. So, you know, obviously the CPG space has long been dominated um, by the big titans in the industry, whether it be um, a company like L'Oreal or Estee Lauder um, or Johnson Johnson with the Neutrogena brand. But what we've seen through direct to consumer is a variety of new lifestyle brands 
pop up, some on a subscription basis, some going direct to consumer to really take advantage of these changing habits and really build a company from the ground up that's just serving consumers directly. So again, I think a lot of the big players in the personal care space um, have their work cut out for them, but certainly see the opportunity in going direct to consumer. Um, 47% of uh, shoppers feel uncomfortable buying furniture online without seeing first. So furniture is another area where you have that sort of fit aspect where consumers don't know if the furniture is going to fit in their home or if the couch they're going to buy is going to be comfortable. Um, also, these are more high ticket items that consumers have to purchase. So this is another area where there's a big opportunity for innovation. Um, you know, companies like Ikea on the on the value side of the equation or companies like William Sonoma, which owns West Elm um, or Pottery Barn have big opportunities now to really um, enter the space. We've also seen companies like Wayfair really take off more in the home accessory space, which again, where consumers have maybe slightly less um, inhibitors actually purchase online. But uh, furniture, obviously a huge booming item right now, again, as consumers invest more in the home. So it'll be interesting to see um, if the furniture space can make that shift uh, to online shopping. Wayfair, as we mentioned, exploded. Their stock went up uh, over 400% at one point this year. Um, as consumers looked at, uh, Wayfair is a great, easy, simple way to stylize, personalize their home um, with accessories. Uh, and again, accessories is the perfect product uh, in this day and age, because while furniture may give consumers hesitation to buy online, um, accessories in the home at that lower price point, but with the ability to kind of upgrade your house, uh, it's no surprise that that company really took off as a result of the pandemic. So now we're going to look ahead. We're almost running out of time. So we're going to talk about six trends um, e in e-shopping that we've kind of extracted from all this. And we're going to go to questions. Uh, first and foremost, um, e-commerce is good for brands uh, for the data. Traditional retail is very limiting. And what we mean by that is that first party data is going to become more and more valuable than ever before. Uh, many of you have probably read about the fact that third party cookies and web targeting is slowly getting phased out of the web. Um, you know, Apple recently announced that they're no longer going to um, allow companies to retarget based upon um, usage of their mobile applications. So it's becoming harder and harder for you to target consumers online when you engage in e-commerce, especially directly through a platform like Shopify, and you can get first party data. You can retarget, build lifelong relationships with consumers. And that's a very big appeal for e-commerce for brands. Um, all in one is valuable to consumers online. Obviously, we've seen that with Amazon, um, you know, give consumers value, but also give them um, a ton of choice and make sure that what they want, you have. Um, not mobile or desktop, it's 360 that's king. Again, the pandemic has forced many consumers to use their desktop-based devices more so than the mobile trend we were seeing prior. Um, and you really need to have that presence both on mobile and desktop that are immersive experiences. And if you have a physical um, you know, retail presence, all the better. Um, E-shopping tactics for replenishment are key. Um, if your product is something that is replenished and bought on an ongoing basis, you have the opportunity for recurring revenue. That creates a big opportunity for you to invest in this space. Uh, buyer assurance is critical. So we talk about apparel and consumers not really feeling comfortable. One thing Amazon has really capitalized on is buyer assurance. Consumers know they can always return things on Amazon with no problem. And now that has sort of become the de facto expectation. Um, and lastly, disloyalty is a new normal, but it become a trend that's good for brands. Consumers are trying new things right now. So it creates an opportunity for you to enter spaces that maybe before you were locked out of because consumers are trying new things. So we are going to now turn it over um, to Abel, who's going to show us the answers from our Ask America segment. And then we'll turn it uh, over to questions. So Abel, you want to pop on? Abel is one of our amazing, hardworking people from the Suzy marketing team. So here he comes. Abel. Good to see you again. Absolutely. Results of two of the questions that we asked. So which brand do you miss visiting in store the most? Um, so very interesting here. Uh, you know, I think we talked about earlier, but apparel is still one of those things that a lot of people are struggling with uh, without trying. So we saw Adidas and Nike pop up uh, a bunch there. And then, um, you know, for some other people, they miss going in store to Target, uh, Walmart, and then we kind of see clothing um, pop up there. Yeah. As well. It's interesting. One point there. So Sephora, obviously, was very popular for allowing people to try on their makeup in store. And that was a big driver of their in-store traffic and obviously something they, they can't offer right now. Uh, and then Victoria's Secret, I mean, 
you know, it just shows the dichotomy sometimes between market performance and consumer demand where, you know, this is a company that's really struggled, um, you know, from a, from a stock perspective and from a sale perspective, but at the same time, consumers are saying they miss it. Um, and nostalgia of the Victoria's Secret. So that's, that's definitely something that popped out to me. Definitely. Um, and I think here, you know, what types of products do you wish there was a subscription for, service for? So I think this is right in line with what we were talking about earlier, which is there's an increase in people buying, um, you know, food and cleaning supplies online. We see the growth of online shopping. So um, interesting to, to see that, but also things like medicine um, that are starting, starting to pop up. I know in New York City here, we have um, things like capsule, which have made medicine really easy to deliver there. So interesting to see that pop up. Um, beverages, skin, so a lot of things that are kind of playing in that uh, general same vicinity there. Absolutely. Cool. Okay. Cool. So we can um, bump it over to Q&A, but before we do that, I'm just going to do a, a quick plug here. So um, thank you guys all so much for joining. Next week, um, we're going to have a really wonderful follow-up conversation with Kraft Heinz and PepsiCo. Um, we're really going to be diving into how two of these brands are really changing their approach to consumer insights. Uh, we'll talk a little inside baseball and, and kind of give you guys a, some view into how some of the largest companies uh, are dealing with things, not only like direct to consumer, but uh, also the ever you know shifting nature of consumers. So um, check that out next week. It should be pretty awesome. But um, you know, you first, first question here, um, people are asking, so how do we get that tactile feel from e-commerce? Um, very often consumers like to see and feel the product before um, they actually purchase it. Scott, um, Scott. You, any thoughts there? I mean, I think, I think one of the things that we've sort of danced around a little bit today is, um, you know, I think there's a lot of interesting things happening with um, remote use of video, either in the context of the sort of live streaming sort of push, obviously something that's been a little bit more widespread in the China marketplace for a while now, but something we're seeing happen a lot more in terms of, um, you know, the, the US market and sort of other markets around the world. Um, and then that's a little bit more of a one to many um, kind of context where it's a little bit more social, a little bit more sort of like the a, a newer version of QVC. Um, but then I think there's a lot of opportunity there with, um, you know, sort of one on ones in terms of a brand representative or a retailer um, giving um, these sort of like almost remote, um, you know, sort of in-store service through the context of, you know, um, a, a live stream or a, or a sort of in-person video, which I think is pretty huge um, and, a, and a really great opportunity for um, consumer or businesses to tap into. Um, and then, you know, some of the things that Matt tap, uh, tapped into before, which is like the black tux experience, which is like, you can try on a piece before, um, you know, you um, decide. You can imagine that being sort of paired with a live sort of remote styling session as well. Um, and so I think there's a lot of opportunity there for brands to add value um, at various points in the sort of purchase uh, journey. Definitely. So uh, another interesting question here. So one of the concerns that they have is that e-commerce and the way that e-commerce is booming now, um, it's leading a lot of the independence and mom and pop shops um, getting easily edged out. Um, so eventually we're going to see that people are going to go for what they see on the top Amazon recommended uh, or the algorithm might win or people with bigger spends um, might start to edge them out. So for, for those more smaller independent businesses, um, you know, what is your recommendation to them? How can they play in this um, Amazon driven environment. So I think you need to find a niche. So, you know, who are the first 100, 250 consumers that would want to buy your product? How do you cater towards them? How do you listen to them? How do you give them a product that meets their needs um, and build a Shopify experience, meaning your own store? Don't go on Amazon because if you go on Amazon, you're not going to be able to collect first party data. So you won't know who those people are. That, that, that's a big issue that a lot of companies do. They jump on Amazon, they don't know who their consumer is, and then they can't you know, create lookalike modeling. They can't go out and actually expand because Amazon's keeping all the data. Um, so do the hard work to identify your audience, create a great experience, and once you learn from that core audience, slowly build out. 
But I think, you know, don't try to make, you know, a product for everyone, try to make a product for a very particular niche of consumer um, and, and then go out and expand upon it. And I think that creates opportunity, but listen, it's not the same way it used to be in terms of just throwing up a shingle and opening up a storefront. You need to be sophisticated with, you know, the, the ad buying tools and programmatic and, you know, your ability to be able to fulfill and, and deliver in a, in a cost effective way. So it does take a whole new set of skills uh, set right now to go out and actually build um, your own store in the virtual sense. Definitely. Um, and this question, next one is, as more and more consumers are now buying online, um, obviously, we've seen there's been issues with sustainability and over packaging, especially with Prime and the easy, um, you know, shipping of single products. Uh, maybe Scott, a question for you, but what do you think the future will look like when it comes to sustainable packaging? Uh, um, when it comes to it's, a it's a challenge. I think, um, you know, it's it's the reverse logistics thing is going to be a huge um, sort of aspect of this, which is, um, you know, ultimately, how are you? You know, if you're if you're going into more sustainable packaging, and certainly there's the, you know, biodegradable materials, the new sort of innovations that are happening with like packaging in that sense, um, that feels a little bit further out to me. Um, whereas thinking about, you know, you have packages coming in and out on a sort of daily basis, um, and so thinking about either sort of like multi-use packaging that can be sort of picked up and returned. There's a really interesting company called Loop, um, which is a subsidiary of uh, TerraCycle, which does a lot of the sort of sustainable packaging. Um, and they're working with, in the grocery and CPG space, um, um, sort of essentially building refillable containers for the haagen of the world, et cetera. Um, and they have a whole sort of logistics piece in place where, you know, as you're, and again, going back to that sort of recurring revenue, as you're finishing packaging, um, that's returned as new stuff is coming in. Um, the the old packaging is sanitized and then refilled and delivered to another consumer. Um, and so I think that whole sort of like refillable space is going to be really interesting. So sort of putting the onus of packaging onto the business rather than to the consumer to deal with it, I think is a, a huge opportunity there. Definitely. Um, so next question here is, how do you feel uh, businesses can better deliver an emotional brand experience that you would traditionally get in store in retail uh, beyond the more functional benefits of convenience that you uh, get through e-commerce? So I think, first of all, how can you bring your friends along the journey? I think, you know, the, the best way to, to kind of bring an emotional experience from a consumer is to make it so social. So is there a way where you can shop with your friends, bring your friends along, ask your friends for feedback on whatever on something you're going to try on? Um, I think that could really create a tight connection with the experience and the brand itself. Um, I believe if there's a way to create some type of local flavor to whatever you're doing, I think that's important as well. So if there was a way where you're buying something online, but you knew who else in your local market was buying it, or is there a way to support the businesses in your local market by buying this product? That's another way. And then lastly, anything that's cause-based. Um, how can you actually be socially responsible as a brand, especially in this day and age when so many people and organizations are in need? Um, that's another way where you can give back, um, do something good as well as kind of inject some type of emotional component to the online shopping experience. Yeah, I would I would just add um, the community piece, which you know, you're sort of hinting at there as well, Matt. Um, yeah. You know, with a lot of these direct to consumer brands that, you know, going back to your previous response, like did a lot of work building up these sort of small communities over time, understanding what was relevant to them. They really thrived early on in COVID because then they were able to sort of tap into that community and provide experiences to them, whether it was, you know, wellness related things or just like education and sort of, um, you know, distraction during the midst of all the crazy stuff that was going on. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity to, you know, bring education, product optimization, all these things that sort of help people achieve through the context of your brand, which is really exciting. And then um, on the social shopping sort of tip, um, there's a new app or sort of service called Squad Shopping um, yeah. that um, folks should check out. It's cool. 
it's sort of like a layer on top of an e-commerce experience that allows you to bring um, friends along um, and and do exactly what you sort of described, which is which is cool. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, all right, final question for you all here, but again, kind of going back to the mom and pop shops and also the in-store physical retail, a lot of times that's a place for people to um, maybe discover new products that they never would have had exposure to otherwise. Um, so I guess, you know, my question to you both is, um, you know, in an environment where they only have kind of the algorithm, like what's the best way for, for people to discover those new types of products um, that they may not have even known that they were gonna go purchase in-store? I think there's been some really interesting stuff happening just in a very sort of ad hoc context with um, store windows. Um, and so making those shoppable sort of first and foremost, I think is really interesting. I think, um, you know, text is a big opportunity for any sort of small brand looking as a way to sort of connect with consumers. Um, you know, it's a poll it's a pull rather than a push sort of um, context. So people are choosing to sort of engage with you in that way. And so um, if you can establish a rapport with them through text, then that can carry on into the sort of store experience, um, which I think is really interesting. Um, and then, you know, we, we touched on it earlier, but having some sort of a presence probably um, Instagram is the one that's probably most important just in terms of <laughs> providing a point of view um, for your store and and what it is that you're selling is is uh, probably the one that you would want to you know start to sort of think about sort of early on absolutely definitely and that's uh, all the questions uh, that we have for you all great so uh, I want to first of all uh, thank Scott our special guest uh, from PSFK Scott you've been uh, uh, you and the PSFK organization have been so great to work with, especially during uh, the pandemic. Looking forward to doing many more uh, reports and hopefully one day live physical events. But uh, uh, in the meantime, this will just have to do. So thanks so much, Scott, for joining. As always, you guys and yourself provide great insights. So um, awesome. yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. This was this was great. And for anyone that wonders, my uh, puppy was behind me and he knocked the photo onto my head. Um, <laughs> not to look on my face for a moment, but hopefully I recovered well. So um, thanks for thanks for bringing me uh, along. Awesome. And Abel, thank you and the entire Suzy marketing team for putting this together. Uh, I'm Matt Britton, CEO of Suzy. If you have any questions for me in terms of how Suzy, our product, can help you put your finger on the pulse of today's consumer, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, on behalf of the whole team, I want to thank you guys for continuing to join our State of the Consumer webinars. And don't forget to join us uh, next week as our brilliant Chief Customer Officer, Katie Gross, is joined by uh, two of our valued clients, Nick Graham, VP of Insights and Analytics for PepsiCo, and Kim Spade, Head of Consumer Insights for Joint Ventures at Kraft Heinz. So be sure to register for that. Uh, but until then, on behalf of myself and the studio team, Thank you so much for your time. Hope everyone stays safe out there. Until next time, take care, everyone. Bye-bye.